The moment an engine quits after takeoff, your instincts shout, turn back. The runway looks like salvation, yet this single maneuver, the impossible turn, has killed more pilots than storms or sabotage. Even top professionals cannot escape the four-second delay that robs them of altitude, and by the time you realize the math does not add up, physics has already sealed your fate. Why does doing what feels safest so often end in disaster? When the engine quits, the clock does not start at zero. It starts at minus four seconds. That delay is the time it takes for your mind to catch up to what just happened. Four seconds feels like nothing. In a climb, it is everything. Your hands grip the yoke, but at first they do nothing. Your eyes scan the panel, searching for something, anything, that will tell you this is not real. The airplane does not wait. It keeps moving forward, burning up altitude with every second of hesitation. Studies of real-world accidents and simulator tests agree. The average pilot loses about four seconds to shock and confusion before making any meaningful move. Four seconds sounds trivial. It is not. In a climb, those four seconds cost you roughly 400 feet of altitude. That number is not a guess or a scare tactic. It comes from NTSB investigations and pilot training records. 1,000 feet per minute is 66 feet per second. Do the math. By the time you react, you have lost the height you needed to even have a chance. This is not about skill or experience. Airline captains with decades in the cockpit freeze just as long as student pilots. The startle effect is built into the human brain. It worked on the ground, but in the air it becomes a thief. It steals your only currency, altitude. You cannot buy it back. Investigators rewind cockpit audio frame by frame, listening for the first sign of a response. The pattern is always the same. A stunned silence, a whispered curse, a frantic scan of switches. Only then does the pilot act. By that point, the airplane is already lower, slower, and closer to the edge of what is possible. Four seconds, 400 feet, gone before you even start to turn. This is why the runway behind you is so deadly. It looks close, but the altitude you had when the engine quit is not the altitude you have when you finally move. Every second you spend in denial is a second the ground claims for itself. The stopwatch does not care if you are a good pilot. It only cares how fast you can accept the truth and act. On January 15, 2009, an Airbus A320 lifted off from LaGuardia with 155 people on board. Minutes later, both engines failed at altitude after a bird strike. In that cockpit, Captain Chesley Sullenberger and First Officer Jeffrey Skiles faced a crisis that would test every layer of their training. Controllers offered a return to the airport. Sullenberger listened, weighed the options, and said the single word, unable. He knew the math. The aircraft was losing altitude too quickly. The runway, though familiar and close, was already out of reach. That decision was not made in isolation. While Sullenberger flew the airplane, Skiles ran through the restart checklist, searching for any sign of power. Three flight attendants readied the cabin. Within seconds, the cockpit became a hive of coordinated action. Each person focused on one task. That is what professional crews are trained for. Professional crews divide the impossible into manageable pieces, and they buy time by sharing the load. The entire system is designed to create a margin, even when seconds count. That margin is the difference between life and death in the thin band of altitude after takeoff. After the accident, investigators ran simulations. They found that a perfect, instant turn back to LaGuardia was just barely possible if the crew responded with absolute precision and wasted not a single heartbeat. But when the real-world delay was added, even the best pilots ended up short of the runway, in the water, or worse. In the actual event, Sullenberger had four minutes, thousands of feet, and a team. He used every second to keep the airplane under control and everyone alive. Not a single life was lost. Compare that to the cockpit of a general aviation pilot, alone, a few hundred feet above the ground. There is no first officer to run the checklist, no crew to brief the cabin, and no dispatcher reading out options. Every task, flying, troubleshooting, communicating, lands on one person's shoulders. 
The time that a professional crew carves out through teamwork simply does not exist for the solo pilot. When the engine quits in a small airplane, the clock is merciless. There are no extra hands, no backup. You get only the seconds it takes your mind to clear, and then the ground starts claiming its due. The Sully case stands as proof. Even when everything goes right and every resource is in play, the margin for turning back is razor thin. For the solo pilot, that margin disappears before the first decision is even made. The difference is not just in the airplane or the altitude, it is in the number of hands and minds working the problem. And in general, aviation, that number is always one. A steep turn is the pilot's last hope when the runway feels just out of reach. The logic seems simple, bank the wings hard, swing the nose around, and get back to safety before running out of sky. But every degree you bank is a silent trade with gravity, and the math is never in your favor. At a 45 degree bank, the airplane is not just turning faster, it is carrying a heavier burden. The load factor jumps to 1.4, one times the force of gravity. That is not a theoretical number. It is a physical reality pressing down on every rivet and on your own body in the seat. This extra load changes the rules of flight. The stall speed, the slowest speed at which the airplane can fly safely, rises by about 20% at a 45 degree bank. If your airplane normally stalls at 55 knots in level flight, now it is closer to 66 knots. But the engine is dead. You are losing speed and altitude every second. There is no power to help you keep the wing flying. You are squeezing the controls, trying to hold the nose up, but the margin between flying and falling is shrinking with every heartbeat. The physics behind this are unavoidable. The lift vector, which usually points straight up, tilts as you bank. Part of that lift now pulls you sideways through the turn. To keep from sinking, you have to generate more total lift, which means increasing your angle of attack. But there is a hard ceiling, the wing can only give so much before it stalls. The higher the bank, the closer you get to that ceiling, even if your airspeed has not changed. In a gliding turn where speed is bleeding away, the stall arrives sooner and with less warning. This is the trap that catches even experienced pilots. The instinct to turn back forces you into a corner where the numbers do not work. The airplane is fighting two enemies, gravity and drag. Every extra knot you need to stay flying is a knot you do not have. The stall does not care how badly you want to make it. At 45 degrees, the margin is razor thin. A slight pull on the yoke, a gust of wind, or a moment's distraction is all it takes for the wing to quit. And once it does, the outcome is almost always the same. Turning back to the runway is not just a matter of swinging the nose 180 degrees and lining up with the pavement. The geometry is far more demanding. The moment the decision is made, the airplane is already drifting away from the airport, carried by its own momentum and by whatever wind is blowing aloft. The path back is not a clean half circle. It is a 270 degree arc, first away from the runway, then around, and finally back to align with the center line. That means more distance, more time, and more altitude lost than any pilot expects in the heat of the moment. At best glide speed, a standard trainer might need 25 seconds to carve out that path at a 45 degree bank, burning through 500 to 700 feet of altitude if the turn is perfect and if no time was lost to hesitation. Altitude and airspeed are being spent with every second. The airplane is already lower and slower because of the startle delay. The pilot is fighting to keep the nose up, but every second in the turn means more altitude traded for the hope of reaching home. Then comes the wind. Takeoffs happen into a headwind, which maximizes lift and shortens the ground roll. As soon as the airplane turns back, that headwind flips into a tailwind. Suddenly, the ground is rushing by faster than the airspeed indicator suggests. The airplane's ground speed increases, pushing it farther from the runway with every heartbeat. The pilot, desperate to make the numbers work, banks even steeper, trying to tighten the turn and get back on course. The steeper the bank, the higher the stall speed climbs, and the less margin there is for error. The tailwind does not just add speed, it adds drift. 
The airplane overshoots the runway centerline, forcing another sharp turn to realign. Each correction costs more altitude, and the spiral grows tighter, the margin thinner. The pilot is now flying a path that is longer, faster, and riskier than the brain ever imagined from the cockpit. The numbers are unforgiving. A 270-degree turn at low altitude, with a rising stall speed and a tailwind, stretches the airplane's limits to the breaking point. Records and simulator runs confirm what the math predicts. Pilots who try to beat the geometry almost always run out of sky before they run out of turn. The runway behind them becomes a mirage, close enough to see but always just out of reach. The final moments are a scramble of control inputs, a race against physics that ends, almost inevitably, with the ground claiming victory. A steep bank, a desperate pull on the yoke, and the margin vanishes. In the final seconds of the impossible turn, the inside wing slows just enough to betray the pilot. Airflow separates from the wing surface and lift collapses. The nose drops. The airplane doesn't simply descend, it corkscrews. The spin begins with a snap, the aircraft rolling sharply toward the ground. At this altitude, barely 300 feet above the earth, there is no room for recovery. The spin is not a gentle spiral. It is a violent, tightening spiral dive. The inside wing stalled and the outside wing dragging the airplane around in a sickening arc. Investigators replay these moments in slow motion, frame by frame. The control inputs are clear, a sharp bank, a last ditch pull to stretch the glide, and then the fatal pause as the wing gives up. The numbers are absolute. Once the airplane enters a developed spin below 300 feet, the outcome is set. No pilot, no matter how skilled, can reverse the aerodynamics in that space. The airplane rotates two, maybe three times before impact. The ground arrives faster than the mind can process. In the wreckage, it is always the same, the telltale signature of an inside wing stall, the unmistakable pattern of a low altitude spin. These are not recoverable accidents. They are the final proof that instinct, when it runs against physics, is a losing bet. General aviation accident files are filled with stories that end the same way. In 2019, a Cessna 172 took off from a small airport in Georgia. The engine faulted at about 400 feet. The pilot, who had 20,000 hours in his logbook, banked hard to return to the runway. The airplane stalled and spun in, impacting inverted just short of the threshold. The NTSB found no mechanical fault. The cause was loss of control during an attempted turn back. A Mooney M20 in Texas suffered a similar fate. Power loss at low altitude, a steep bank, and a desperate pull to keep the nose up. The turn tightened, the inside wing stalled, and the aircraft entered a spin at barely 300 feet. The crash site told the story, a short, violent spiral with no chance for recovery. The report cited excessive bank and back pressure during the attempted return. Even the Piper Cherokee, a forgiving trainer, has not escaped this trap. In multiple cases, pilots tried to turn back after engine failure just above the treetops. Most never made it. NTSB records show that over 90% of these maneuvering accidents end fatally, while the majority of straight-ahead landings are survivable. Simulator tests reinforce the message. With perfect timing and altitude, a turn back can work. But add the real four-second delay, a tailwind, and the average pilot fails almost every time. The numbers are overwhelming. Skill and experience are no match for physics when the margin is razor thin. Before every takeoff, veteran pilots recite a single, unbreakable rule. If the engine quits below 1,000 feet, land straight ahead. No exceptions. This isn't bravado or tradition, it is a survival contract. The insurance company owns the airplane the moment the propeller stops. Your job is to walk away, not to rescue a piece of aluminum. Safety briefings start with this decision point. Pilots touch the panel, scan the horizon, and say it out loud. Below 1,000 feet, I go straight ahead. The logic is simple. At that height, there is not enough time, not enough airspeed, not enough altitude to gamble with a turn. 
The numbers from the NTSB and decades of wreckage make this clear. Pilots who try to save the plane rarely save themselves. Pilots who accept the loss, who choose a field, a road, or a patch of trees, survive. One survivor, a private pilot from Indiana, remembers the moment his engine coughed at 600 feet. He pointed the nose at a cornfield, kept the wings level, and rode the airplane down. The landing was rough, the airplane was destroyed, but he walked away without a scratch. I knew I had to let go of the airplane to keep my life, he said. That is the creed. The airplane can be rebuilt. Your family cannot replace you. The assignment is clear. Before your next takeoff, brief yourself. Say it out loud. If the engine quits below 1,000 feet, land straight ahead. Let the insurance company buy the wreck. Make sure you walk away. Every year, pilots face the split-second moment when survival means rejecting instinct and trusting discipline. NTSB data shows that straight-ahead landings save lives, while the turn still claims even the most experienced. Today, training manuals and checklists echo this hard lesson. Lose the plane, not your life. In aviation and in crisis, physics always has the final word. Stay safe. Fly smart. Your choice is right tomorrow's accident report.